My girlfriend of seven years and I rented a beach house Airbnb in the Hamptons on Long Island in 2018. My girlfriend's name is Alicia. The house was very secluded, and it literally sat right on the beach, like back door led to the dunes. It was also more or less a completely private beach during the day, except for the occasional locals going for walks or jogs along the dunes. We were there for three days and two nights. During the daytime, for the most part, we lay in the sand with drinks, or we'd jump in the pool in the backyard of the house. The first night, we went to some local bars to drink a little bit, then went back to the house to relax and watch a movie. The second day there, like I said, we basically did the same thing as the first day. Only this time, we hopped in the pool first before going to lay on the beach to dry off. The house was absolutely gorgeous, a fantasy home for Alicia and I. Woods surrounding the house, pool in the backyard, and beach ten steps from the back door. It all seemed like it was going to be a fantastic weekend getaway. We stayed on the beach for many hours, until around maybe like four or five. Right as we started packing up and I stood up, I looked at the house, at one of the windows specifically, and I thought for sure I could see someone standing at the window, looking down at me. The sun was kind of creating a glare on the window at its current position, so I couldn't tell 100% if my eyes were playing tricks on me. I grabbed Alicia's shoulder and pointed up at the window. Do you see that? I asked. When she said, see what? I could see that whatever I thought I saw didn't seem to be there anymore. I told her to keep packing up while I ran back to the house and up the stairs to the bedroom window where I thought I saw someone or something. The room was empty though as was the closet under the bed and the rest of the upstairs rooms. The only noise was the sound of the window air conditioners in various rooms, and then the door opening downstairs. It was Alicia arriving with the stuff, so I chalked it up as seeing things after lying in the sun for hours. That night we hit a couple of the same bars again. We stayed out later this night because it would be our last night there. I think we got back around 11. Upon entering the living room, we tried to flick the lights on, but they wouldn't. Then we noticed all the digital clocks from the cable boxes were off too, so the power was out. I looked around for a circuit box, but couldn't find one. It was way too late to call the homeowner. All that would happen is we'd miss out on watching a movie that night. We were tired anyway, so we just went upstairs using our phones to provide us enough light to prevent us from falling on our faces up the stairs. We went to bed, and the alcohol in Alicia's system helped her knock out pretty quickly. But then, I sat up when I felt like I heard something from outside of the room. I looked at the doorway. Someone walked past the doorway in the hall. I covered my mouth with my hands to prevent my squeal of horror from being heard. I lifted myself over Alicia to get off the bed and run to lock the door. The second I locked it, there were knocks on the other side, and someone said, it's the landlord. I came to fix the power. I didn't believe it for a second. The knocks turned to more aggressive bangs, and the door started to shake as the man on the other side started twisting and shaking the doorknob. My girlfriend woke up and started to scream as she realized what was going on. I screamed, call the cops to her, and I think this caused the man on the other side to stop. The next thing that happened after waiting in silence and fear was the sound of the police officers downstairs. They had entered the house through the front door that was apparently left open. The police investigated, took a report, and said they'd let the local media know of the incident. They even helped us find the circuit box and restore power. The next day, we left first thing in the morning, and on the ride home, I called the landlord, who said he hadn't even been near the Hamptons for a few weeks. The story I'm going to be telling you took place around four years ago as of today. I haven't told many people about this story because it's something I try to forget. Here's my story. It was a Monday evening, 4th of July. I just finished sophomore year in high school. I was invited to a few 4th of July parties. My parents grounded me a few days prior, so I couldn't go to any of them. However, I live in a neighborhood that's very connected, so my neighbors had a party outside in the cul-de-sac. My parents forced me to come outside for it. I'm not extremely awkward or anything, but I hate talking to older adults because I never know what to talk about. 
Luckily, I had a friend named Eli who lived in the same area, so I called him up and we hung out at the party. After a few minutes at the party, we got extremely bored. It just wasn't fun for us because there was no one our age in the area. We talked a little bit. Then Eli asked, doesn't Savannah live like down this street? We should go door ditch her. I agreed to Eli's suggestion and we were on our way down the street. To clarify, Savannah is that extremely popular girl that every guy has a crush on in high school. It was awkward enough that we were neighbors, but her dad was also my dentist. We made our way down the street. The sun began setting quickly. Eli and I made jokes about dumb things we found funny at the time. Being honest, we were both pretty nerdy our sophomore year. I eventually asked Eli if he knew where the house was located because I had never been to Savannah's house before. After scanning the whole area of houses, Eli began pointing to my west. He was pointing at a big house that was pretty complex. We lived in a mediocre area in Michigan. Houses like this one were rare here. Anyway, we sneakily approached the house. It was only to our surprise that no one was home. No cars in the driveway, the lights were off, nothing. We both began observing the house. We agreed that she probably went on a trip with her family. I suggested that we come back next week and do the door ditch. Eli didn't listen though. He kept staring at the house. He approached the front door. Eli, let's go, I yelled. He told me to be quiet as he opened the front door. His face lit up. They left the door unlocked. Eli suggested that we explore the house and that it would be quick. Being the curious teens we were, we entered the house. It was dark and extremely cold. We both split up, exploring the enormous house. I went into every room of the house and began to feel extremely guilty because that was considered breaking into someone's house. Also, we were invading the family's privacy. After a few minutes of contemplation, Eli began screaming. I walked over to the screams and found Eli. He was leaving what I believe was Savannah's room. Why are you screaming? I asked. He began walking me to the nearest bathroom. He locked the door and started whispering, there was someone watching me in the closet. I tried reassuring him the person was probably a family member who thought we were breaking into the place. He immediately responded why would he be hiding in a girl's room then? From what I saw, the room's walls were entirely white, the bed covers were white, and it just overall gave off a girl's room vibe. I became suspicious myself. That was when we began to hear footsteps approach the bathroom door. We tried listening, but the walking seemed to stop. I told Eli to be quiet. Someone started mumbling something outside the door. Shortly after, there was knocking on the door. It started out soft. As it continued, it got louder and louder. It sounded as if someone was trying to break down the door. It started becoming a scene out of a horror movie when the person started screaming. It was a man's scream. I turned around and panically tried to open the window behind us. It was bolted down. I thought we were dead. There was a wrench right next to the toilet, and I used it to destroy the window. We jumped out of it and fell onto the bushes below. I still managed to break my ankle, but we ran out of there fast. Both Eli and I were so confused as to who that person was and what their intentions were. A few days passed, and the family came back. I couldn't take the guilt anymore. I turned myself into the cops and admitted to breaking in. The cops asked me a few questions. Later, they sat me down with my dentist, or the homeowner. I began the conversation with, Yes, I'm guilty, but the guy hiding in your daughter's closet nearly tried killing me. My dentist showed mercy and didn't press charges. However, he just started to become anxious as he told me. We never invited anyone to stay at our house. I used to work at this small sleepaway camp as a counselor. It was my first job when I was 17. It was the most fun I could have at any job that age. Plus, it would get me away from my parents' house for a month. I didn't exactly come from an enviable background. So at this camp, there were five buildings. 
the boys' dorms, the girls' dorms, the counselors' dorms, the main hall, which we called the shack, and a small bathroom building. In the shack was the cafeteria, main office, and nurses' quarters, where any kids who suffered any kind of injuries would be brought. Kids' curfews would be 9 o'clock, curfews only meaning they weren't allowed out of the dorm buildings past that time. I made good friends with this guy named Johnny. He was three years older than me, but we got along. It was a Friday night. I remember because I knew it was the start of the weekend. So for fun, Johnny and I went to hang out with these two girl counselors, who I'll leave their names out for privacy since I haven't seen them in many years. The four of us went out to the woods to smoke. One of the girls were mid-sentence when all we heard was a crunch of leaves in the vicinity. Surely a footstep. All of our heads turned the same way and at the same time. We all heard it. Then, a few seconds later, there was a blinding flash. We didn't understand at first. Unnerved, all of us cut the smoke sesh short and exited the woods at an extremely quick pace. Being back on the campgrounds felt a lot safer immediately, but we became paranoid that we were being watched by one of the camp supervisors and that the flash was a picture being taken. We would surely get fired if we were caught smoking weed. So in a paranoid panic, we all rushed to our respective dorm buildings. The thing about me when I smoke weed though, I get extremely paranoid and overthink everything. So as I sit in my bed, it ate away at me wondering if it was indeed a camera flash and who took that picture. I couldn't take it anymore. I had to go to the shack and see if any of the supervisors were still working and come clean. Every counselor had a key to the building, so I unlocked the door that led to the cafeteria section and the door slammed behind me, echoing into the dark, empty building. The only light was coming from that hallway which I would take to get to the main office, hoping there would be someone still working. You may think I was crazy to be doing this, but I'm not exaggerating when I say I get paranoid, and I really couldn't afford to lose this job over something that wasn't even my idea. However, I would feel out whichever supervisor was on duty and see if they had actually seen what we were doing. As I walked down the hall towards the office though, I realized quickly that the office light was off. No one was in the building. Just then, I heard the familiar sound of the cafeteria exit door that I had just went through slamming again. Was I seen entering the building? Was I being followed? I hid behind the intersecting hallway wall peeking my head around, waiting to see who would be walking into the hallway. No one ever did though, but it took me longer than it should have to notice something peering around the doorway to the cafeteria. It was a person's head. They were doing exactly what I was doing, peering in my direction. When I realized this, I didn't care about being quiet anymore. I ran as fast as I could to the nearest exit, feet stomping on the wood flooring. I ran to the counselor dorm, where only three counselors were still chilling in the common area, one of them being Johnny. I told him and only him about what I just witnessed. I didn't know what to think other than I was being followed. I think Johnny could tell I was being a little extra paranoid because I was high, so he told me to just go to my room and lock the door. He made sure to lock the main entrance to the building because I think I scared him too. That night I lay awake for a while, thinking, nervous. So many unanswered questions from one night. The beds in every counselor's room lay right next to a window without blinds, so moonlight would pour in on clear nights, but not on this cloudy night. It was just pure darkness. Until, however, many hours after laying down, a flash filled my room. Lightning? No. There was no thunder, not even rain. I looked at the window and all I saw was someone's silhouette out there. When they noticed me noticed them, I saw their hand making a waving motion at me. That was the last straw. I left my room screaming for Johnny. He had already gone to bed at this point, so I banged on his door till he opened up. I told him the man who was following me was at my window, so he went to check with me, but figures he was gone. Johnny asked me if I was still high. I told him not at all, it had been hours. I asked if we should call the cops or something. He said no. He told me to sleep on the floor in his room with my blankets if it made me feel better. Low-key, I think he wanted me to because he was scared just like I was. I didn't understand why on the surface he was pretending to not take this seriously given that he saw the first flash in the woods with me. 
I did sleep in his room though. I didn't want to sleep alone, I was too terrified. The next day, I went to the main office to talk with one of the supervisors. She didn't really know what to do. She didn't call the police, but she gave me permission to call them if something else happened, for the safety of the children. But nothing happened again. Not until the last day on the job for counselors. This was when the kids had already went home and it was the day we were supposed to pack up and leave. I woke up to four pictures taped on my window. One zoomed in on me in the woods that night with Johnny and the two girls. A second picture of me sleeping in my bed. A third picture of me entering the shack building that night we smoked, confirming I was being watched and followed. And the fourth picture, a zoom in of my license plate number. I took the photos and showed them to the same supervisor. She kept them for evidence after writing down my whole story, including the smoking weed part. This was many years ago now, and nothing ever happened again, but I was scared to death that the picture of my license plate was some kind of threat that whoever it was would track me. I still don't know who took those pictures.